Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our tutorial on uh, knowledge infused learning for autonomous driving. Um, with my uh, co organizers, uh, we'll be uh, working uh, through this emerging topic uh, of uh, knowledge infused learning and its applications, its applications in the uh, autonomous driving domain. Uh, before uh, we uh, go into the discussion, let us first look at uh, where are we in terms of autonomous driving uh, progress. Uh, the autonomous driving research dates back to the 1950s, uh, where uh, the focus was on uh, like cruise control, uh, seat belts, and anti lock uh, uh, brake, uh, this type of uh, safety or convenience uh, features. Then, it, when we move to 2000 and 2010 era, um, people have been looking at uh, advanced safety options such as uh, electronic uh, stability control, uh, blind spot detection and lane departure warnings. Uh, then in the 2010 and 2016 uh, range, uh, uh, it has gone to a bit more advanced uh, uh, drive assistance, like uh, we had uh, rear view uh, videos, uh, automatic uh, emergency braking, and the lane, centri lane centering uh, assist. Yeah. Now, uh, according to uh, NHTSA, uh, uh, now we are, uh, in the partially automated safety era, where uh, most cars we see have the lane keeping assist, uh, uh, adaptive cruise control, and traffic uh, jam assist. Uh, so, according to NHTSA, uh, it will take like 2025 uh, and beyond uh, for us to have fully automated safety features. Uh, as of now, in year 2022, uh, more than 200 billion investment uh, was drawn to uh, autonomous driving area. Uh, in terms of automation level, we, uh, the most uh, the, the cars that we have uh, right now uh, operate on automation level two. Corey will be actually talking about uh, uh, this aspect uh, in his talk. Okay, then let's uh, take a look at uh, what are the key challenges in autonomous driving. Uh, first uh, of many challenges is uh, hardware limitation. Uh, when you take an autonomous car or a self-driving car, uh, it has a bunch of sensors like LiDAR, radar, uh, cameras, uh, different types of cameras. Uh, these these uh, sensors, they have uh, uh, limitations in their sensing capabilities and tolerance, uh, different tolerance level to a driving condition. For example, uh, if you are driving in a heavy fog area, the cameras uh, in use might not be uh, suitable to capture uh, you know, denoise uh, the uh, images. Then the second limitation, main limitation is software limitations. Uh, here, uh, you know, in the autonomous cars, the uh, computer vision and machine learning models are heavily used. But as of now, uh, there's no general agreement on what uh, type of uh, safety or accuracy requirement should we have um, for us to have for us to have you know widespread use of uh, uh, autonomous cars. Uh, the third challenge is open road driving. Uh, unlike other uh, application domains, so the autonomous driving is uh, autonomous uh, driving has this inherent uh, uh, limitation. So even for us humans, uh, when we are driving, let's say uh, in a place that are, that is not familiar for us we'll be facing with a lot of uh, unseen or novel uh, situation. So uh, it's a challenge for the autonomous cars to uh, be able to adapt to these novel or unseen situations and safely navigate uh, through the roads. The fourth challenge is um, uh, regulations. So we also need to look at uh, how would the autonomous cars uh, comply to legal and ethical norms. Um, this is an active research area in the ethical AI and the legal community who are working on the applications of the autonomous driving and the use of autonomous driving. Uh, the final limitation or the challenge here is uh, a trust. So assume that uh, hypothetically we have uh, uh, worked out all the other limitations. Then comes the question, so uh, how would the so uh, society or people accept uh, the widespread use of autonomous cars on their roads. Um, would we be comfortable having all the cars, all the trucks uh, driven fully, uh, auto, uh, fully, uh, fully autonomous? Uh, so this is also a challenge. 
So in this background, uh, uh, our tutorial uh, aims at uh, uh, looking at the knowledge infused learning of the neurosymbolic AI uh, applications. So the neurosymbolic AI uh, is gaining traction in uh, application areas where the safety is a concern. So in safety critical applications, we are now looking at uh, uh, neurosymbolic AI because uh, it provides more abilities to uh, explain the predictions uh, than the black box uh, machine learning models. Uh, so we uh, evaluate uh, how can knowledge infused learning of the neurosymbolic AI can be used for uh, this safety critical application, which is the autonomous driving. The second aim is uh, we will be reviewing the current state of the autonomous uh, driving and identify uh, applications uh, uh, of neurosymbolic KI uh, for uh, the autonomous driving domain. Uh, third, we will be providing a basic familiarity to uh, open domain AI datasets. So uh, in recent years, uh, uh, autonomous driving research, uh, so, uh, when we are doing autonomous driving research, we have a bunch of good high quality uh, or open domain data sets. So we'll be uh, talking about them and also show how to uh, use them for neurosymbolic AI applications. Uh, finally, we will demonstrate three uh, recent innovations of neurosymbolic AI um, in, the, in the domain of uh, autonomous driving. Uh, so let's talk about the today's uh, agenda. The first, uh, we will talk about uh, an introduction to knowledge infused learning. Uh, then uh, the second talk is on the applications of autonomous driving. Uh, then we will have a 10 minute break. So after that, uh, we have uh, like three uh, deep types. Uh, these are three uh, uh, demonstration of auto uh, knowledge infused learning in the autonomous driving domain. Um, so the first uh, technical talk is uh, knowledge based entity prediction. The second one is uh, explainable theme clustering. So after that, we'll have another 10 minute break. And finally, uh, we have the last technical talk on road sign recognition. And if you have time, uh, I think we can also go for a discussion uh, with the uh, audience. Let me uh, introduce the introduce today's speakers. Uh, we have uh, Corey Henson uh, from uh, Bosch Center for AI. Uh, Corey is a lead research scientist at Bosch uh, working on uh, applications of a neurosymbolic AI in the autonomous driving domain. Uh, then we have Sebastian Wanka, he's a PhD student at the uh, University of Prayer as well as uh, a research scientist in uh, Bosch Center for AI. Uh, he's working on his dissertation, uh, towards his dissertation on applications of uh, uh, graph neural network uh, uh, and neurosymbolic AI for roadside recognition tasks. Uh, then we have Daria Stepanova. Uh, she's also a research scientist at uh, Bosch Center for AI. Uh, she's working on uh, uh, another application of uh, application domain uh, here uh, in the autonomous driving. Uh, her focus is mainly on uh, explainable scene clustering and scene typing. And we have uh, Dr. Amit Sher, the professor at the computer science department and the director of the uh, AI Institute at the University of South Carolina. Uh, he is mainly focused on uh, the knowledge infused learning with applications in various domains, healthcare, manufacturing, uh, mental health, uh, uh, and all. Yeah. Uh, and my, uh, I, I'm Ruan Rikramarachi. I'm also a PhD student at the uh, AI Institute uh, of the University of uh, South Carolina. My dissertation uh, is focusing on introducing uh, expressive knowledge representation techniques uh, and learning techniques for uh, no, uh, autonomous driving domain. Uh, with that, uh, let us first uh, go to uh, let us go to our first talk, uh, introduction to knowledge in peer learning by uh, Dr. Amish. Over to you, Dr. Shed. Okay. Um, So I will uh, give um, introduction to the core concept of how knowledge is brought into the statistical learning framework and uh, particularly the variant of neurosymbolic AI where knowledge plays critical role. <clears throat> uh, there's increasing uh, 
you know, starting 2012, so just about a decade ago, uh, there was a, a transition from machine learning to deep learning, um, and where um, we saw significant importance of the big data and, and, and using uh, neural network, deep neural network based algorithms uh, to learn from the data. Um, and um, for many applications, uh, we have seen some tremendous process, uh, progress. Applications are typically uh, classification, prediction, recommendation. Now we have found that um, while uh, some of those, there are several problems that statistical AI can solve very well, uh, we again start to see the value of uh, the type of AI that used to be uh, prevalent before statistical AI uh, took the center stage. Uh, that is a symbolic AI. And so explicit representation of the knowledge and uh, manipulation of symbol or symbols and, um, and manipulation of the symbols, uh, such as the reasoning uh, techniques. We, we see that essentially data alone is not enough and that we need to uh, you know, combine data-centric statistical AI with knowledge-centric symbolic AI. So uh, in that particular context, uh, you know, with that as a realization, we are um, seeing this growth of neurosymbolic AI. Within that broader neurosymbolic AI um, research uh, thrust, um, there is a uh, version of that, there is a uh, part of it where a variety of knowledge infused or integrated into this um, neurosymbolic AI play important role. So knowledge infused learning we define as use of knowledge of, that can be of variety of kinds and application semantics to enhance existing deep learning method by infusing relevant conceptual information into statistical data-driven computational approach. Um, so uh, there is a, uh, there is a, um, uh, group uh, in the uh, AI field, which uh, completely puts its bet on deep learning. I feel that that group is uh, becoming smaller uh, and there is increasing, as, as we increasingly understand uh, limitations of data uh, alone strategies. Um, the very good example is that uh, you train a uh, language model, large language model, um, and, um, and then you interact with that. Uh, there was a chatbot recently where uh, a user interacts with um, uh, the chatbot and the chatbot, uh, you know, agrees uh, to the patient's or, or, or user's um, uh, point that uh, the person should kill himself. So that basically shows that if you, you know, the, the, that AI system that is interacting now is reasonably dumb. Uh, and reasonably, um, you know, not uh, aligned with the human values, human decision making, uh, ethics, and many other issues. So um, um, there are similar examples where um, um, the system gets baffled when you rely only on the data, and these are the examples where um, you can. Um, see that something else is something is missing and what is missing there is appropriate use of knowledge and why not use the knowledge because uh, humans have um, invested massive amount of effort in um, capturing the knowledge often from the experts in that domain and um, you know the source can be a, a, a whole variety of things for example source can be a wikipedia and um, Accepting structured knowledge from Wikipedia, and Wikipedia is edited by um, tens or hundreds of thousands of people in a very highly editorialized process, or it could be UMLS, uh, which is um, you know painstakingly developed by people in medical sciences. Right? Here is one example that shows uh, the limitation of um, you know of understanding the language without the use of knowledge. 
So here is there is a text here. Uh, the text can be on a Reddit or text can be on a web forum. And uh, you can see what the text talks about. And uh, when you work with epidemiologists, uh, there is a, an epidemiologist, epidemiologist would look at this text and uh, gain quite a bit of understanding about the text. Um, you can see that um, the text has entities such as Savaxon. You can see the text has a uh, dosage such as 180 milligram. You can see the um, Texas interval, for example, 48 hours after it has relationships like the triples you see on the bottom right. It has pronounced route of administration. For example, I injected and sentiments. So there are a lot of things in this text um, that um, if you try to uh, you know, use statistical learning, you will have a very hard time uh, getting at all of these things. One example, a relatively simple example, is that um, uh, the expert would know that buprenorphine is a generic substance, and Subutex and Subaxone are brand names, and that bup and bup are slangs or, or street names, right? And that they are the same. So being able to understand bup with very little, uh, relatively uh, limited occurrence of bup in the data set. Um, without having the knowledge is uh, very hard. We'll, we'll have very low precision for any such technique. So in this particular case, we develop a uh, pretty comprehensive knowledge graph for ontology called drug abuse ontology, which models all of these kind of things for the domain. And that makes, this po makes it possible for us to um, understand and annotate this diverse set of data. The similar situation will also exist, although I'm not giving you an example and that work needs to be done. Uh, in terms of vision, there are many aspects of any picture or image you see and that um, understanding a variety of aspects um, uh, without it just, um, uh, you know, learning from data uh, is not possible. Um, and, and a lot of nuances, a lot of uh, objects, a lot of um, uh, things that you should be keeping a, you know, um, note of will be missed if all you have is to uh, is a um, CNN or some other uh, technique, uh, neural network technique applied on, on data, on pixel, right? Um, there are... Uh, very important issues in terms of developing AI applications. Examples include uh, explainability and safety. Interpretability, explainability, and safety are, uh, or trust particularly, are extremely important uh, before people will uh, start using your uh, solution. So in the um, example here, you see ex uh, the example of healthcare. Um, a doctor would, uh, even if you can show that um, your AI technique is better than human uh, in classification, let's say, uh, the doctor is not going to use your technique. Um, doctor has to be convinced uh, as to how, or, or be, uh, you know, uh, be told or shown how the machine learning or deep learning has come to that particular uh, conclusion, that particular, um, you know, result. Um, only then the doctor can uh, take the next step. And there are many um, challenges. I'll, I'll discuss one or two of them here. So here you see there is a definition in the middle top uh, of OCD, obsessive compulsive uh, disorder, right? And it has various, various concepts. Um, in uh, Definition could be more complicated as saying it should be present uh, the, there should be these concepts that should be present and this concept that should not be present as an example. Now, um, coming to a conclusion that OCD, um, that, that this text uh, reflects OCD, requires uh, more than what a, a neural network will uh, give you because neural network would be a black box approach. It will give you the result, but it can't explain. But a uh, doctor has to make sure that um, 
he can be convinced or she can be convinced that uh, the uh, definition of OCD has been followed in coming up to that conclusion. So there are concepts uh, such as obsessive uh, and disturbing uh, thoughts that have to be uh, isolated and understood in the, in the text in this particular case. Um, and um, there can be a concept of, let's say, uh, you know, risky uh, bisexual behavior that can also be, um, uh, you know, relevant in the choice or decision making. And only then you can come to the conclusion that indeed this is um, obsessive OCD, not just because some uh, black box algorithm say that it is a, uh, you know, a, that, that this classifies to uh, OCD. So um, the use of knowledge, the, you know, the concepts you're seeing on the left-hand side is uh, unavoidable. Uh, and, you know, if you are going to be able to explain, uh, you know, why this is indeed OCD, and then combined with the, um, uh, you know, high quality of results, and uh, the doctor would uh, accept use of such a technology. Now, interesting to note that there are many types of knowledge that are necessary uh, uh, and, and, and possible and relevant in, uh, and, and that it varies from different situation. So on the left-hand side, um, uh, there are a kind of knowledge that um, uh, are used or, or concepts that are used from a more of a systems perspective as to, um, uh, you know, whether you are, um, whether this algorithm, uh, you know, fits the result. And so, for example, the particular explainable part of it is what I tried to already uh, demonstrate to you. Uh, on the right hand side, I give a very interesting example. Uh, I will, um, uh, you know, argue that um, a human um, uses broad variety of knowledge to understand the language. We are not talking about natural language processing, such as the, uh, you know, trans language translation. Um, there, it is possible to do the translation without understanding what the text means. But there are other um, uh, large area of uh, research where you need to actually understand the text. In, in doing so, humans would use lexical knowledge uh, where we have uh, understanding of grammar, like what we do in dependency parse. They will under use linguistic knowledge, such as what we have in WordNet. Now we don't, all of us don't remember the whole WordNet, but we have parts of it, our things that we are interested in, we have come across it over the period of time and we somehow remember, or we somehow uh, conjecture it up. Then we have common sense knowledge, such as what uh, is in the concept net. We also have broad base or general purpose knowledge where we say that um, uh, a, you know, a particular city is a capital of a, a state. That kind of knowledge is something that we all know and apply in understanding. We come across a news item and we um, uh, listen to Kyiv, for example, then we say, oh, okay, well, that's the capital of Ukraine. Uh, and we, that context gives us um, understanding of the text. And finally, we apply domain-specific knowledge. Well, there's also more that I've not shown. There, is a, there can be a significant use of locational knowledge, uh, such as the one in GeoName. Uh, so um, all this kind of knowledge is something that humans uh, use to understand. And um, this is something missing from the current uh, uh, neural network-based algorithms, the deep learning algorithms. And um, I know it is... Uh, I guess uh, for me, it is very obvious that um, without using this appropriate knowledge to a particular, for a particular application, uh, the uh, statistical approach is going to fall short, come short. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, DARPA talked about three waves of AI um, in the first wave, uh, first uh, phase. Uh, was called, um, you know, uh, the statistical, sorry, uh, the, the symbolic AI one, which can describe you, describe to the system 
like we used to write rules for expert systems and that was handcrafted knowledge and there were challenges because you know comprehensively capturing all the knowledge as rules uh, or any other form uh, is very very pain difficult um, and, and also there were performance and many other issues and also there were limitations or pros, pros and cons of the choice of knowledge representation second came statistical learning uh, where you can categorize very well and that's what i just talked about you know in this century with uh, machine learning and then uh, neural network based um, uh, deep learning uh, we have had a lot of progress in uh, certain for and that were relevant to certain applications and finally uh, the third phase which is where we have entered in a way now um, and that essentially is captured by hybrid ai neuro symbolic ai um, and where i uh, you know appealing to you that um, you, that neuro symbolic ai uh, necessarily requires in most cases if not, not all but in most cases particularly for higher level of intelligence uh, such as you want to do analogy such as you have abstraction for this kind of stuff uh, contextualize you really need uh, to use knowledge explicit knowledge um, uh, so um, uh, there um, you want to combine the neural network or deep learning algorithms with the knowledge graph based um, approaches uh, and then um, uh, uh, for applications where the ai system helps users with decision making taking actions this explainability and trust and other things are extremely important they are not going to come without use of knowledge so the, how do you um, infuse the knowledge um, and how do you uh, make use of the knowledge um, well there are um, uh, a broad variety of ways uh, to um, in incorporate the knowledge and um, uh, my team uh, is quite involved in developing a variety of techniques and uh, uh, there is enough of work done that it will take me a whole day to go through everything that is happening in here but let me uh, introduce you uh, something uh, that we introduced in 2019 where we basically um, you know simplified the variety of ways in which knowledge can be combined with uh, black box deep learning techniques so the first one you see on the left hand side is a shallow infusion and broadly what happens here is that you take um, you have your neural network techniques that um, vectorize uh, you know data that that create vectors uh, from the data and uh, has multiple layers then before uh, coming through with the outcome um so here basically um the knowledge uh, is um, uh, kind of uh, mapped into or, or constructed into um a, also a vector space and basically embedding techniques are very very popular and uh, by doing so uh, the knowledge is brought to the level of data more or less and then um uh, uh, they are combined so you can you can combine the vectors and uh, you and these techniques have been able to show some benefit um over you know just the uh, data alone techniques um but that is often not sufficient um uh, so the next class is called semi deep infusion techniques and these uh, try to get into the uh, deeper and congruent incorporation or integration of knowledge graphs into learning techniques um and finally there is a uh, um deep infusion techniques uh, where the statistical and symbolic approaches are integrated in a far more intertwined way um and um as i had shown in my previous slide that uh, you know you have variety of knowledge that you need to uh, incorporate I, these are i will call stratified knowledge right you have different uh, layers of knowledge and um uh, you have to carefully um incorporate the right type of knowledge at the right place in the deep neural ne network in the right layer of the neural network to enhance the technique so um uh, that uh, is a deep infusion technique which is where uh, you know uh, i think a lot of current research are focused uh, you know 
uh, are, are looking at. Um, that work is not, you know, I mean, it's kind of at early stage, I would say. Uh, now, in terms of cello infusion, uh, this slide just shows you uh, a number of techniques uh, where uh, the knowledge is used. Um, what to work is very well known. Uh, uh, but uh, is now very, very well known, of course. And here you can use domain specific, uh, you know, corpora, large corpora related to a particular domain to improve. So you can pre train bird with a, uh, you know, knowledge, uh, uh, one knowledge or another knowledge uh, or more than one knowledge, for example. So uh, what happens is that in the semi deep infusion technique, um, you uh, take the knowledge and try to improve upon the attention mechanism in the, um, uh, in the neural network uh, based architecture. And um, uh, that uh, afford on attention, uh, for example, um, um, you may uh, understand that um, there is a big difference between World War I and World War II. They are very different concepts. But syntactically, um, they are pretty close, right? So um, use of um, knowledge, uh, explicit knowledge, will help you uh, understand that these concepts are much more distinct. And that way, it will improve upon the performance of, uh, the, um, uh, uh, of the deep learning algorithm. <clears throat> and that, that ability to knowing that World War I and World War II are different and uh, improving the attention to where you're making the distinction in the text uh, is what this class of techniques would do. Another very interesting thing that uh, we work on and that is very important is that there is, um, there is something, called, we, we, something we call process knowledge. So in a medical field, for example, uh, doctor get trained in the way you uh, come up with a diagnosis. And you say, you do this test, uh, you check this uh, variable, uh, you uh, rule this in, do you rule that out. So a step of process or workflow um, is followed in coming to a decision. Now, uh, you know, uh, neural networks by themselves don't do that, right? Uh, so uh, really, um, incorporating the process knowledge um, in, uh, you know, uh, is necessary uh, if you are going to uh, verify for the clinician that um, the, anal the analysis of the text, the processing of text is consistent with the medical guideline that the clinician is required to follow. Right, each medical disciplines have clinical di guidelines. Cardiovascular, you know, uh, doctors have their own guidelines. Mental health professionals have th their own guidelines coming from um, a, uh, a text called DSM-5. DSM-5 is the document that mental health professionals use. Uh, are you, you know, used to to teach them? Uh, you use DSM-5 to basically uh, train mental health professionals. Well, they outline the processes to come up to a decision that have to be integrated, right? So, uh, and, and you can think that even in the autonomous driving, you might have to uh, take two, three, four step, uh, you know, process before you can be uh, pretty sure and understand what is the situation you are facing. And then, um, you know, the deep infusion where um, uh, basically the idea is that you have this layered um, technique, uh, you know, uh, here the layers are shown from left to right in the bottom, uh, you know, pic uh, picture of the picture. And that right type of knowledge is brought in. Uh, and, and there is a concept uh, that is very important, um, uh, uh, the concept of abstraction. So um, think of uh, different layers in, um, uh, a deep learning algor algorithm focusing on different uh, you know aspects different abstraction and that uh, you know for example 
in the image, the lower refraction is your pixel. But then somewhere above, you get to the edges and you get to the contours and you get to the objects. And then you get to the you know, characterization object and their movement and so on and so forth. So as you uh, go through that um, understanding, uh, a different levels of abstraction in your deep learning algorithm, different uh, appropriate type of knowledge is used to understand that. And that is the class, that is one of the, um, you know, uh, and by the way, there, um, uh, the knowledge infusion can also come, uh, you know, uh, to your help in using right uh, modality of the data. So you can see the your different type of data, text, video, sensory, image, speech, that, is, you know, that, that you face, all of them have to be brought together. And um, uh, I think the human brain is very good at, uh, you know, uh, uh, doing this, but human brain also, in my view, uh, uses semantics, not just at a bits and byte level. And they are able to connect the, information that this text relates to this part of the image. Um, and, and that is a powerful um, a work that has to be done. So the knowledge has to be infused at the right level of abstraction in the deep learning. Um, to end my part of this to, you know, tutorial, uh, let me uh, give you a couple of examples. Um, uh, actually, the one on the left is mu much more easy to understand. So. Um, a high level of intellectual ability, you know, uh, activity that humans are involved in is called analogy. Um, analogy is considered to be uh, a, an excellent way to learn. Uh, and teach, you know, students uh, often uh, are asked to use the analogy or train in using analogy to understand. So here, uh, uh, when you are training um, a person uh, with concept in cybersecurity, um, there is an analogy from personal life domain that many more people can understand, are aware of already. Uh, and so there you want to map, um, uh, you know, to, to say that, is this a good analogy? The analogy of personal life domain, is it a good analogy for describing cybersecurity domain that uh, a concept that you need to understand? Well, um, if you are doing a uh, word level similar uh, analogy, uh, it's quite possible that your traditional deep learning algorithm works fine and even sentence level. But once you start getting into this kind of um, uh, uh, paragraph, multi uh, sentence level and paragraph level, and uh, later on document level, um, you know, it becomes impossible for uh, a deep learning algorithm to uh, understand different parts. I have to make sure that there is a concept of exploit uh, on from both the source uh, which is personal life to the target, which is uh, cybersecurity, that there is exploit that maps, the concept of steel that maps, and that there is a valuable item on the source side, which maps to sensitive information on the uh, target side, right? So these kind of things, it shows you the necessary uh, role of uh, something like knowledge graph or structured knowledge in um, you know tasks such as analogy building, right? Uh, similarly, on the right hand side, um, there is a, a particular uh, stepwise process uh, defined by um, uh, you know uh, CSSRS in this particular case, uh, Columbia Society Severity Rating Scale. Uh, if you want to understand um, uh, Reddit forum on suicide uh, related discussions, uh, then um, the clinicians will be using something like CSSRS to understand uh, what is happening and for machine uh, to also understand to the level that expert may understand, they will also have to use this particular process knowledge and then uh, they, you, you'll be able to uh, understand what the text says at the right level of granularity uh, and, uh, you know, at, at the level of with the possibility of explainability. So, with that, let me uh, end my part and uh, pass it on to Corey, uh, the lead um, uh, research scientist at um, uh, Bosch Techno um, AI Center. And um, uh, he leads a group in uh, just the topic of this tutorial. Uh, by the way, um, Corey played a central role in the World Wide Web uh, Consortium uh, 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 group that came up with semantic sensor networking standard. 
Gori, on to you. Thank you, Dr. Shath. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Just let me know when everybody can see it. Okay, can everybody see the screen now? Yeah, we can, but you may want to do a, a slideshow. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Sheth, for that introduction to the, the technology we're going to be discussing today. Um, so for my part, I'm going to try to introduce the domain topic of interest, which is autonomous driving. Um, and maybe more importantly, I'm going to try to introduce the, the, the question that we're going to address throughout the rest of the talks, which is, um, is neurosymbolic AI useful for autonomous driving? Um, and I hope in the, the subsequent technical talks, we'll, we'll be able to demonstrate that, that it actually is, and this is a true statement. Um, so maybe I'll start with a bit of history. I, I found this article um, a few days ago, um, which talked about the, the, the first time that Bosch tried to develop and demonstrate a, a driverless vehicle. Um, so this was done in uh, 1973 at the International Motor Show. Um, and the basic idea was they wanted to develop um, uh, a truck that could transport materials um, within environments and situations where it was just unsafe for a human driver, right? So for example, driving through a coal mine, as an example, transporting coal, yeah. And the, the way this was accomplished was to um, lay a, a wiring or um, a, a cable um, within, the, the, within the road. So it was embedded within the road. And then they could use radio frequencies to transmit signals from that cable to the vehicle um, as it was driving. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the... The, the types of signals they can send were, were basic actions, right? So, you know, turn left, turn right, you know, accelerate, uh, stop, these kind of things. Um, and, and on the right-hand side, you could see kind of a, a demonstration of a, of a person throwing a box out in front of the truck and the truck coming to a stop, yeah? Um, so this is interesting. Of course, this is not using the, you know, the, the AI uh, technologies that we have today, but it planted the seed of an idea that even back then we were thinking about, you know, how do we um, take the, the human driver out of the vehicle, right? Um, in certain situations. And we're, we're continuing that process today, yeah. Um, and so when we, when we often think about autonomous driving, um, or when I talk to people about it, um, oftentimes our minds go directly to the end goal, right? So a vehicle that can completely drive on its own, um, and there will be no driver in the vehicle at all, kind of like the truck that I showed a minute ago. Um, and while that's certainly the goal, um, the, the, the autonomous driving technology is actually a spectrum, right? Um, so, and we often kind of categorize the spectrum into five layers or levels, yeah? So all the way to the left at level zero, there is absolutely no automation and the human driver is in complete control of the car at all times. Um, as we move into level one, you know, some basic functionality can be, um, transferred to the vehicle itself. So think about like cruise control, right? So in this case, the car is responsible for maintaining um, the speed of the vehicle um, at all times and the driver doesn't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah. Um, so the actual levels probably aren't so important here. The, the idea is that as we increase, as we move through the spectrum, um, we transfer more and more of the driving functionality from the human driver to the AI or to the vehicle itself, right? So when we get up to the higher levels, so like at level four, um, the vehicle can completely drive itself, but perhaps it's it's not completely trusted. And so we need a backup. So you, you wanna keep a driver in the vehicle 
just in certain situations where that driver could take over if needed. Um, and then level five is when um, we, we can completely move, remove the human driver from the vehicle altogether um, without any need for a backup. So there's, yeah. Um, so we can have dr cars driving on their own completely. Yeah. Okay. And so, as I mentioned, um, we are at a specific point on the spectrum. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, we're, we're working on technologies across the spectrum. Um, we're doing research at the, the, the latter phases. And then at the earlier phases, we have technologies that are actually um, being pushed out to vehicles. Um, I've, I've written down a couple of them here that some of you or probably all of you are familiar with. Some of you may have these technologies in your car now. So things like adaptive cruise control, um, lane keeping assistance, um, so you don't veer off of out of your lane. Automatic emergency braking has been around for quite some time now. Um, evasive steering support, where uh, the vehicle can detect you know um, dangerous situations and try to move the car um, out of the way automatically. Yeah. Um, so this is not um, a, a pipe dream. I mean, we're not seeing fully autonomous driving, but we do see products entering the market. And we're going to continue to iterate um, and move closer and closer to the, the overall goal and vision of fully autonomous driving. And when we when we think about the the when we think about this technology, we often divide it into multiple phases, right? Um, so we have the sensing phase, the thinking phase, and the acting phase. Um, so the, the sensing phase is where uh, we utilize all the sensors um, in a vehicle. And on a modern vehicle, there are thousands, tens of thousands of sensors um, really detecting anything and everything imaginable. Um, most of those sensors are measuring kind of the internal state of the vehicle. Um, but then also with, with autonomous driving, we're, we're, we're developing and integrating sensors that are perceiving the, the external world. So trying to, um, you know, these are things like cameras and LIDAR, um, which we can then use to detect the objects and events in the environment, right? We often call this, um, you know, situation awareness or um, scene understanding in our case. Um, within my group at Bosch, we primarily focus on this first phase of sensing. Um, and specifically, we're focused on uh, situation awareness around the eco vehicle. Um, but um, we can then use that situation awareness to help with the second phase, which here they refer to as thinking. Um, but this is this is often um, often also in reference to the planning phase, right? Where we want to take our understanding of what's going on in the world plus the goal um, that the vehicle has in order, and then develop a plan, a plan of action, you know, what actions the vehicle should take in order to reach that goal within that particular situation. Yeah. Um, and then once, once we have a plan and we make the decision to execute on that plan, then, then we reach the acting phase uh, where we send those signals to the, the actuators in, in the vehicle. Um, to, you know, uh, direct it on how to maneuver, right? So as I was mentioning in the very beginning, um, with, the, with the truck that ran by cable wires, it sent signals to stop um, and accelerate and turn. So those are still the signals we, we use today. Um, but we can also send uh, um, instructions that are more complex, right? So like, it's not only stopping, turning, but you can combine those together to, for things like, um, overtaking or uh, merging into a, a crowded lane. Yeah. Um, and then, so these are the three phases and these kind of work in a cyclical way, right? So we're constantly sensing, um, trying to understand the environment. We're then planning our next, um, our next moves and then acting on those decisions. Yeah. And we try to go through this cycle as fast as possible. Okay, so to, to develop the technology um, that we're talking about here, um, 
Well, th there's lots of technologies to develop um, in order to achieve this goal. Um, and so, of course, there are, you know, unlimited numbers of companies who are offering their products and services to achieve this, right? Um, we often, do, you know, we can categorize the technologies into different, um, uh, yeah, into different categories. So we have, of course, tools, we have components, we have platforms. Um, within the components, we could talk about the processing components like data processing, uh, sensing, data connectivity, mapping, software, security and safety. Um, now, if, if we were to play Where's Waldo for, for Bosch, for example, we can see that Bosch is kind of has its hands and a lot of the different categories here. And so we do a lot of work developing sensing devices for vehicles. We do work in the data connectivity space, as well as security and safety, um, as well as developing an overall uh, platform for autonomous vehicles, right? So the entire software stack. Um, so yeah, so this is a this is a pretty exciting space to be in. It's it's very fluid, and there's there's new companies coming in all the time um, to help us develop this technology. Okay, so now now to the the heart of the matter, right? Okay, so Dr. Sheth did a good job of introducing us to this idea of neurosymbolic AI um, and knowledge infused learning. Um, and like I mentioned in the beginning, we're interested to know, you know, how this technology can be applied for helping us with autonomous driving. Um, and when, when I think of neurosymbolic AI, I like to conceptualize this um, as it's depicted on this image in the left. Um, so this picture, or at least a, an earlier version of it, was first introduced by Mike Bergman about 10 years ago, or at least that's the first time I saw it. Um, and he referred to this as the virtuous cycle of knowledge-based artificial intelligence. Yeah. And the basic idea is that, you know, of course we're developing knowledge graphs, right? To, to represent all the information we have within a particular domain. And we can then utilize that knowledge graph um, to improve our machine learning capabilities. Yeah. Um, and then going the other direction, we can utilize machine learning to improve our knowledge graph. And this, this actually, this cycle creates a feedback loop where one technology is improving the other, thus completing the virtuous cycle. Yeah. Um, and on the right, I've, I've listed several topics um, in this space. That, that I think are quite interesting and relevant in the context of autonomous driving. Um, some of these topics we are currently actively working on within my group. Um, others are you know, of interest, but maybe left as future work. Um, maybe we can convince some enterprising uh, students or researchers to, to help us out um, with some of these areas. Um, so the first is knowledge completion. Um, so, Anybody who's developed knowledge graphs um, probably know that, you know, developing this, this, these representations can be a time-consuming task. Um, it, you know, sometimes it's, it's di they're difficult to scale, um, and almost always the knowledge graph is incomplete, right? And so, knowledge completion is the task of taking the the information, the knowledge that we already know and trying to use it to fill in the gaps, right? So to, to learn the knowledge um, that is currently not available in our graphs based on what is already there, yeah? Now in the first talk, um, the, the first talk after this one by Ruan, we'll show a really good example of the use of knowledge completion for improving our scene understanding and situation awareness um, for autonomous driving. Um, the second second topic is unification and integration. Um, so knowledge graphs are are really great at integrating um, heterogeneous data from multiple sources. Um, and within the the driving space, 
we have this in abundance, right? We have, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of sensors um, we want to, that, that we need to integrate data from. We have, um, as Dr. Shen mentioned, we can, we can take this data and translate it into higher levels of abstractions like objects and events. We need to integrate that information. We could pull informa information from external sources, so information from the web, um, and we need to represent it in a normalized form, which then we can then use uh, as training data for our learning. Yeah. And so, yeah, so representing all of this data into knowledge graphs of driving scene data uh, is an important task. Um, going on to the next one, um, coherency, consistency, and correctness. So this is specifically important when we're dealing with domain or uh, use cases that are, you know, that are high risk or use cases that are safety critical, like autonomous driving, right? The, the, the knowledge in our knowledge graph and the, the data that we use for training really does need to be correct. Um, if it doesn't, then there are serious consequences. Um, this actually is very aligned with, with the next topic, which is explainability, right? Again, with, with safety critical applications, where we're, we're letting automated systems, automated agents make decisions, um, it's very important that we understand how those decisions were made and why they were made. Um, and this is going to become a requirement, especially when we start getting insurance agencies involved and lawyers involved, for example, during a, a wreck. Like if, if a car, if there's a car accident um, and you need to assign fault, um, well, the, the car should be able to explain itself on why it made the decision it did. Um, in the second talk of the day by Daria, um, she's going to give a great example of how we can utilize knowledge graphs um, to provide this explainability um, for, for driving scene data. Um, so the fifth topic is ethics, values, accountability, and law. Um, so that, that's a lot of words, <laughs> but the basic idea here is that, you know, since we've been driving vehicles, we've been developing regulations and rules of the road to dictate how those vehicles should behave um, on the road, yeah, or in their environment, right? So if there's a stop sign at an intersection, the car is supposed to stop. Like everybody knows this, um, and we can, we can take this rule and represent it in symbolic form, right? It's a universal rule um, and we can write it down. Now, I'm of the opinion that um, we don't need to relearn this rule, right? We don't need to learn that cars should stop based on example data. Um, rather, it would be probably more useful if we could simply infuse this knowledge or inject this knowledge directly into our decision-making models, yeah? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very much interested in, in seeing examples and, and proving that we can kind of inject these kind of rules into, um, in, in, in for autonomous driving, yeah. So Dr. Sheth gave, gave some good examples in other domains. Um, and, and I'm hoping we're gonna see more, uh, more examples and research um, in this domain along those lines as well. The, the last topic is efficiency. Um, so here we're, we're, we're really looking at the idea of whether um, using knowledge graphs um, can help to train machine learning models in more efficient and more effective ways, right? So for example, if we have a knowledge graph, um, can we train a model using less sample data? Yeah, without uh, sacrificing performance. Um, and in the, the last talk of the day by Sebastian, um, we're gonna show that, yes, we actually can. Um, and he's gonna show example of integrating a road sign uh, knowledge graph for road sign recognition, um, which definitely improves the efficiency of training such models. Okay, um, so now maybe to the, the more interesting part, the, te the technical topics that we're going to be discussing for the rest of the tutorial. Um, 
So all three of these, these, these technical talks will be related to um, uh, projects that are ongoing um, at Bosch. Um, all of these projects are done in collaboration with university partners. Um, so of course, um, our, we have partnerships with the AI, AI Institute, the University of South Carolina, uh, with Max Planck, with uh, TREA, as well as FZI on these topics, yeah. So the first, the first talk of the day will be by Ruwan at, at the University of South Carolina. And he's gonna tell us about uh, knowledge-based entity prediction for improved machine perception, yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, most of the work in my group is done at the, the sensing phase, the sensing and perception phase, where we're trying to you know, come to some understanding of the scene, the situation that the vehicle's in. And most of our knowledge about the situation comes from um, uh, either cameras or LIDAR data, right? And then we run these, this, these image data through you know, object recognition, semantic segmentation algorithms to derive the objects and events in the scene. Um, and this technology, this computer vision technology is actually very good now, um, but it's not yet perfect. And we find that we're still missing information. We're missing objects in the scene for various reasons that Ruan will get into. Um, but the basic idea here is that if we can represent what is known about the scene as a knowledge graph, um, then we can utilize that knowledge, the, the relations between the objects and events um, that we know about the scene to predict other entities that are likely to be found in the scene. Yeah, and this is using the knowledge completion and link prediction technologies. Yeah, so this is, this is quite interesting and definitely is helping us to improve our situation awareness and scene understanding. The second talk um, of the day will be by Daria, um, a colleague at the, the Bosch Center for Artificial Intelligence. And she's gonna tell us about explainable clustering of driving scene data, yeah. So in, in this work, um, the basic idea is that we wanted to be able to find scenes that are similar to one another, right? So for example, we wanted to be able to, you know, within some database, we wanted to find all accident scenes, yeah. Um, and we wanted to be able to cluster those scenes together. And we can utilize neurosymbolic AI technologies like knowledge graph embeddings to, um, to, to cluster, to find the similarities, calculate them and to cluster them together in this way. Um, but what we're missing is an explanation for why the, the scenes were clustered in the way that they were, right? So why does the, you know, our, our system consider uh, a particular um, scene to contain an accident, right? Well, it turns out it's because, you know, it might contain a police car, an ambulance, and a paramedic. Yeah. Um, and so basically Daria is developing the, the technology that not only can provide the, this clustering mechanism, but then can utilize our knowledge graph of scenes to generate explanations um, for these clusters. So this is, it's very interesting work. Um, and finally, um, Sebastian um, from Treya and also a colleague at the Bosch Center for AI is gonna talk to us about learning visual models for roadside recognition using a knowledge graph as a trainer. Yeah. Um, and this is very much related to the efficiency topic um, that, that I mentioned earlier. Right, so what, what Sebastian has, has found and what he's working on is the ability to integrate um, knowledge graph embeddings with image embeddings, and then showing the benefits of this integration, right? So for example, we could develop a knowledge graph of road signs, um, and then we can create, in, and then we can utilize that knowledge graph of road signs as an embedding to help us train um, uh, 
an, an embedding of the images of road signs, if that makes sense. Um, and then we can basically this provides very good performance on the recognition task of these road signs. Um, but an interesting use case here is that this could also be used for the transferability of the road sign recognition models. So as an example, if you train uh, a road sign recognition model or you know, some, some recognition model um, for road signs in the United States, as an example, um, we can very easily take that same model and then utilize it for recognizing road signs in China. Yeah, so this is what we often refer to as transfer learning, right? T developing a model in one domain and then applying it in another with only a very small amount of sample data in the latter, for the, for the latter case. So in this case, um, the Chinese road signs. Um, and the reason this works is because the, the knowledge graph actually serves as an invariant, right? So it contains knowledge that is universally true. It's true for road signs in the United States. It's also true for road signs in China. And this drastically helps us with this transferability task, yeah? Um, so that, that's, that, that's the end of my talk. Um, so as I mentioned before, I, I really hope that through these three um, more deep dive technical um, topics, we're going to be able to justify the statement that neurosymbolic AI really is useful um, for autonomous driving. Um, and as we saw at the, at the intro with Dr. Sheth, this technology has been used quite effectively in other domains, um, in, in text analytics and um, bioinformatics and healthcare and question answering systems. And we really think it would also be useful for autonomous driving. So um, anybody who's interested in this topic, um, I, I think this is a quite exciting space. Um, and with that, I think we're gonna take a bit of a break. Um, and then when we come back, Ruan is gonna tell us all about uh, knowledge-based entity prediction. Thanks, Cody. Sure. So Cody, are we starting to represent um, uh, 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 knowledge such as these are the road signs that are uh, related to changing the speed of the vehicle. Uh, these are the road signs that are, uh, or these are even in, in, you can start in road sound signs, but then you can increase the layer of abstraction and go and say, uh, you know, that these are the events that uh, recognizing the road, si road sign um, that um, relate to slowing down the vehicle uh, or can allow you to increase the speed of vehicle uh, or that this requires uh, stopping, that this requires uh, changing the, you know, possibly changing the lane. This requires increase vigilant and uh, put... Um, the system in uh, more, um, uh, you know, uh, a mode that would um, be risk covers. Uh, so something that where we kind of uh, map the uh, understanding uh, to rules um, and uh, and then behavior of the car. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. So, okay, so first I'll just state like the, the work that we'll hear from Sebastian is more related to recognition. So based on the visual properties of the road sign, detecting what it is, not necessarily, and that, that's somewhat different than the, the semantic meaning <laughs> that's conveyed by that road sign, right? So detecting a, a stop sign is different from saying, well, um, we can predict that the vehicle will stop. Um, once coming into contact or encountering that road sign, right? Um, but yes, I, I, I do completely agree. So um, 
at some point we need to translate the, 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 the meaning of the sign to the behaviors or intentions of the vehicle that we expect to find. But um, this is a causal relation um, that, that we need to understand, right? So like if, if there is a traffic light coming up, even though the vehicle in front and it's starting to turn yellow to red, even before the vehicle in front of me starts to slow, I need to know that it is going to slow, right? And th that's a crucial piece of knowledge. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the work in trying to derive these causal effects and represent them and use them for our um, behavioral modeling and planning is critical. So in the uh, early phase, uh, perhaps uh, our work on process knowledge infusion could come handy. Uh, I don't know whether you'll need something else or not, but um, this could, uh, you know, uh, tell you, you know, the steps, you know, that you could take uh, if they are described as such. Mm -hmm.